Hey Foos family, welcome to On The Table. I'm your host, Chase Pennell, and today we have a very, very big treat for you all. We have the reigning, the defending, the undisputed, singles world champion with us today, ladies and gentlemen, Tony Spreedeman. Tony, my friend, how are you? Hey, buddy. How you doing? All good. That's awesome, man. Uh, so you are now residing in Florida. You used to be in Wisconsin. That was like when we first met. You lived in Wisconsin. Now you're in Florida. How do you like it? Yeah, well, it's been a while now. It's coming up on uh, 10 years down in Florida. Um, so yeah, almost a decade down here. Time flies. I moved I moved down in the real estate crash and picked up a uh, a foreclosure and uh, I was just sick of the cold up there. I couldn't take it anymore and I've been loving it ever since. I, I bought a, well, those of you who saw me uh, in the movie and on tour, you saw that I, I rode around in a motorhome for a couple of years. I lived in it for a couple of years. Um, that was after selling my first place. And uh, I found a, a little piece of property out in the country, and uh, I live out in the woods now, and it's been it's been awesome. I actually just got back uh, from a little walk with me and the dog, and uh, there was a, some wild hogs running across our trail. We found some bobcat tracks, and, uh, you know, it's, it's heaven, man. It's really, really nice. That's awesome, dude. <clears throat> Fantastic. So... Obviously, you know, we've got COVID going on right now. You don't have the ability to go and tour. Um, is that kind of a bummer in your, your, you know, normal life? Well, you know, there's pros and cons to everything. Um, as far as, you know, COVID goes financially, I mean, this is my livelihood. Foosball is what I do for a living. Um, so it, it has hurt. However, um, I've had to you know, find other ways to, to supplement my income. So I've teamed up with Brandon Moreland and Ellen Moon, and we've been doing the Foos by series uh, lessons. Um, and it's been an interesting experience learning how to, how to not just play, but teach. And it's a completely, completely different beast. Um, understanding how different people learn, um, you know, how to explain things to, to, to different types of personalities. And then not only that, just, you know, it's very easy to go to go through the motions when you've been playing as long as I have, 20, 25 years coming up. Um, so you, you kind of get complacent. You, you get a little bored. And with the lessons, it's actually forced me to go back to the basics and and not just go through the motions, but actually listen to myself listen to the things that I'm saying and, and this go over the strategies that, you know, that I know, but when I play, sometimes I just go through the motions. I don't actually do them. So it's just, it's been interesting. Uh, and in that sense, um, but again, it's just, I roll with the punches, man. Everybody's kind of going through it with the COVID thing and it's a weird time, but you know, all you can do is just take it one day at a time. Absolutely. Um, I, now, when it comes to the Foos by series, obviously it's you and Brandon. Is can anyone sign up? Is it exclusive only to rookies? No, ab absolutely anybody could sign up. Um, we, you know, if you're interested, we just ask that you contact um, if you want a lesson with me, Foos by Tony at gmail dot com, and then Foos by Brandon at gmail dot com, depending on who you're willing. To uh, you know, who you're looking to work with. Um, but what we ask is that you send a video, if you can, some kind of video so we can kind of look over your game and, and, and dissect, you know, some some maybe things you have wrong physically with your game and, and also, like, what, what you're looking to work on. It doesn't necessarily have to be physical. We could talk purely about strategy, um, anything that we can do to kind of help you get to that next level. So, yeah, it's definitely open to anybody. I've had, you know, good pro players um, as well as a complete beginner. So, Awesome, man. That's fantastic. Um, you know, I'm not saying I've done one <clears throat> or anything, but uh, <laughs> I can say that they, I would imagine they're very informative uh, on, on your gameplay and, and, and advancing yourself 
uh, as a player. So, so thank you, one, for doing that, because this is something that hasn't been in the market ever before. Um, and I don't know that, that it was available in any other way than getting to a tournament, learning it the really hard way, getting your uh, butt handed to you multiple times, and now you know learning from people like you and Brandon who are two totally different styles of foosball, um, different yeah. positions, different thought processes. processes. Um, it's, it's an awesome thing that you guys have put this together. Uh, first off, I approve of the coffee. But uh, so <laughs> we should well, definitely. I'll, t- I'll tell you what, there is yeah. there's no substitute for just pure experience on the table. So um, I still say that's kind of the old school way is get out there and tour and, and play as much as you can. But if uh, we're basically trying to give you a few shortcuts along the way, um, that's, you know, the, the, the things that we had to take years and years to learn, we can help you along with. So but again, there's no substitute for just pure experience going out and, and gameplay so awesome i mean and, and you're not wrong obviously you're the world champion so i mean nobody's going to argue with you to begin with uh but we have a match here that we want to specifically talk about um this is going to be 2017 hall of fame classic you are playing with uh mares robert mares uh and you are going to be playing against we have the Billy Pappas, who hadn't played in a really long time, uh, and his good friend, and our good friend, Mark Torres. Um, now, normally, um, you know, and this is years ago, right? So, do you remember much about this match going into it? Obviously, don't give away too many details, but uh, do you remember anything about this before we kind of jump into it? Well, you know, just like you said, Billy hadn't played in a while, so there was a lot of, you know unknown and typically when i go into a match and and especially at the top level you're playing the same people over and over and over i mean it's typically you know ryan blake todd rob you know the same group of guys over and over and over well you know we haven't seen billy actually play in you know five six seven years and and so i didn't really know what to expect and obviously he's like one of the best of all time, one of the, the most amazing players to ever touch a foosball table. So I can't imagine he's just going to forget how to play, you know? <laughs> exactly um, right. So, so there was this, I don't know, not anxiety, but just kind of this fear of the unknown. Like, you know, what's this guy going to do? What, you know, is he going to come out and do a stick series? Is he going to do a chip series? Is he going to do a brush? Like, you never know with him because he could do everything and he could do everything better than everybody. So <laughs> he's just a freak. And then you've got Mark Torres, where most people don't even really know too much about Mark, but Mark is a pretty damn good player. I think he won amateurs back in the 90, 93, 92 worlds. Um, so he's been playing for a long time. He grew up playing with Fernando Rosa and all the guys out in California. Um, but on top of that, he just really knows how to get under people's skin too. He just likes to run his mouth. So <laughs> with the combination of someone running their mouth and kind of pushing your buttons and then the skill set and like composure of Billy, it was turned out to be a interesting match to say the least. Absolutely. There's one yeah. thing before we jump into this match. Um, <clears throat> I've brought it up with everybody that's been on the show because I find it to be, and I like to hear about what other people think. Um, the, and, and this is something I kind of determined a while ago. And let me know if you agree. The difference between a rookie and even a mid-level pro, the skill gap and the difference in playing is really just table time. A little bit of information and mostly table time and practice. But the true difference is very minimal. The difference between a mid-level pro and a pro master is a chasm of a difference because of the mental capacity on the table. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You can look at, I mean, even even really good pros, even masters, let's put it that way, even low-rated masters, they're still a mile away from the top-rated masters. So these these gaps throughout the, the ranks are back to what we talked about experience table time and uh decision making and and in my opinion 
understanding how to set up a match, how to how to make adjustments within a match. But you know, a lot of players, for instance, when I when I'm doing my lessons, I've I've dealt with really good players, and I've asked them like, well, well, when you're going into this match, what what's your game plan? And you'll find that even these these really solid players, they just walk up to the table and they play. And their skill set gets them so far. Um, but when they get into a tight situation, because they've had no game plan, they have nowhere to, to go um, when they get stuck. So even if you have a game plan going into a match, even if it's wrong and you know it's wrong and it's not working, up until that point, at least you have somewhere to go. You can say, okay, well, this isn't working. Now I can do this. And you'll, you'll find so many players that'll do this, they'll do this, they'll do this. They're all over the place. And when it comes to 4-4, four, four, turns into a coin toss and they don't know what to do. So absolutely, I'll agree with you. Um, at, you know, the, the difference between a, a rookie and an expert, expert pro, and, and, and even low master to top master it comes down to decision making and, and table management. All right. So here we go. We have 2017 Hall of Fame Classic. Let's see what Jim Stevens has to say. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Sunday Action here at the 2017 Hall of Fame Classic in Las Vegas. And we've got a good one for you here on table number one. That's Billy Pappas and Mark Torres on the right. Tony Spreadman, Robert Mara is on the left, underway here in game number one, and quickly Tony Spreadman coming out and finding the hole to the near side. Not often we get to see Tony Spreadman versus Billy Pappas. It's always a treat. All right, so um, obviously it's it's fantastic to have Jim Stevens' intro. I mean, if you're into foosball, that's kind of like one of the things everybody always gets to know from watching a foosball match. Um, so... Yeah, Obviously, you're up against Billy Pappas. Uh, you and I have talked about him once before. You have, have said he's probably one of the most talented players ever. Um, and, and he's obviously going to be dangerous in this match. So is that's something that you're going to worry about specifically throughout the match? You're, are, is all of your focus on Billy? Is that kind of... Here's Billy. Yeah, well, and that's a common misconception with Billy is everyone just thinks that he's talented. And to get to the level that he's at, it's, it, it takes more than just talent, just like we talked about it. It comes down to decision-making. So, so Billy is, I mean, he has amazing talent for one, but he knows how to use it, and he just understands the game. And not only that, he's always matched up against me fairly well because, let's face it, we grew up together, we, we were partners. You know, he got to play behind me, and, uh, you know, he, he's, he's just good, man. He's, he's amazing. So, obviously, our, our goal, Rob Mars and I, our goal is to – when you're going against a guy like Billy, you, you can't expect to just completely shut him down because it's just not going to happen. So, get a piece of him, and obviously the more – or the less experienced player – is Mark so maybe get him the ball and let him make a mistake let his two rod possibly make turnovers I, I don't know we, we again it was kind of an unknown going into it so but that's typically what you'll do with that you know master and then like expert or pro you know you know when you have two masters there's not many weaknesses on the table we want to get it to the weaker of the two and uh, so that that's obviously the game plan going in but Okay. If you look at right there, Mark, I think he's drinking vodka or whiskey, and <laughs> he's got his he earphones in. He's flipping his hair like he doesn't. He doesn't seem to have any uh, pressure on him at the moment. So, and that's that's dangerous because when guys like this go into a match and they have no expectations, like they've got nothing to lose. It's like if they, you know, if they lose to us, oh, well, we lost to probably the favorites or co-favorites of the tournament. We probably weren't supposed to win. Oh, Billy, I don't play foosball anymore. I don't really care. Mark, I don't care. I'm drinking. I'm drinking a cocktail in the pits, like you know. So they're going into it super, super like you know, super loose, and that's dangerous when you have guys that know what they're doing. So, absolutely. Um, so I mean. 
going into this, you you know, we were talking about it before. You have a game plan, obviously. Um, you know, you, were, you said you do it in your um, in your Foosby series. You say, hey, go into this match with a game plan. Do you have a game plan going into this match specifically, or is it uh, an overall almost every match I go into it with a, with this game plan? Well, well, that's the thing is when you play. I've got a very cooker, cookie cutter system that I'll use against somebody that I per, perhaps don't play very much or, or I'm not super familiar with their game. So I have a game plan, something like work the wall, you know, and, and work the push side and establish one hole and then build off. It. Very, very simple, very cookie cutter, very, very basic. Okay, but when, the more that you play somebody, obviously. At, the, at that high caliber of player, they're not going to allow me to just do that over and over. So things progress and they change the more that you play people. Um, I remember, now I just had a little flashback. I remember playing with Billy. And I've always known just from playing for years that he, he would drill a top goalie. Just drill him. But then you'll get this random expert who's just scattering their guys around. And, and they would get all over me. He's like, well, I don't know what the hell I'm, well, well, you know, I don't know what he's doing. You know, there's no, it's hard to get a read on some of those things. So I do remember if you watch Rob's defense, that's called Everybody has been anticipating the whirling the dervish. dervish. <laughs> that's the actually, whirling what that, dervish. that's the whirling dervish. So if you look at Rob and I remember telling Rob, he, he said, well, what do you have any ideas on Billy? What, you know, what to do? I'm like, well, I know he doesn't like those super fast scattering type defenses. He, so we said, yeah, we'll do the dervish on him, man. We'll do the whirling dervish. So I actually just remembered watching Rob's D that that was, uh, that was part of the game plan right there. Okay. And we had, we had something to go by. But again, it was years since I played Billy. So It's been years since anybody's played Billy. I mean, he just shows right. up and picks up, <laughs> you know, Mark Torres to play together. Um, yeah. You know, obviously they've been friends for a long time. Um, you and Mares have, have been playing together quite a bit. Um, do you still consider him to be, like, your number one partner for, for majors? Um, well, I've been playing with a bunch of different people. Absolutely. Um, but when it comes down to it, and I, and I want to play a big tournament, for sure, Rob is – not just an amazing player, but he's a really good buddy of mine. Really, one of my one of my best friends. Uh, so that's what makes us dangerous: is that we are not just on the same page on the foosball table, but we're on the same page, you know, as as friends, and we have just good chemistry. So, um, Rob is, yeah, definitely, I would say my my top partner. That's awesome. So, obviously, COVID is still around, but uh, you know. It, Assuming that COVID ends sometime in 2021, um, you'll be back out on tour. You'll be playing again. Um, is uh, it, it seems like your your number one um, opposition is now somebody who mimicked your game to a T, Tommy, uh, Tommy Yor. Is that an accurate statement? Um. This is a quarterfinal, by the way. Really to, to the I would say he, he's yeah. up there. Yeah, he's, he's one of the top guys. I mean, I'm still always going to consider uh, Ryan the biggest threat, even, you know, even though he hasn't been playing a lot and even though he's, you know, deeply rooted in his business and now he's got a couple of kids and or he's got one, one child and another one on the way. Um, but, you, again, you can't – you can't substitute experience, and Ryan's really an amazing player. So I, I would still say Ryan's probably the toughest competition out there. Tommy, Tommy still has a little bit of the element of surprise for me, and what I mean by that is, I mean, over the 25 years of playing, I've never had to play myself before. So I'm still kind of getting used to blocking a far wall tic-tac, uh, and the way that he shoots, he's amazing. He's an amazing player. I'm not taking Absolutely. anything away from him. But um, I'm still learning. And, and I, I just think Tommy's an amazing player, but someone like Ryan who just has a little bit more experience than him, 
is, you know, he's proven himself. Sure, absolutely. Time after time after time after time. I've played him in every final, I mean, for the past five, six, seven years. So, obviously, Tommy's someone to look out for, and hopefully he can, you know, take Ryan out for me. <laughs> and maybe, maybe help me discover something, you know, a way to play Ryan a little bit tougher because, you know, I have a lot of respect for him. But Tommy is really on his way there. He still has some some work to do and just some experience to gain. But I I love to help him because I, I actually like Tommy. He's a really good kid. Uh, actually, his birthday was yesterday. Happy birthday, little buddy! And uh, so yeah, he's just a really good kid, genuine, and and I see a lot of myself in him. So it's it's nice to to kind of help him along the way and. It's nice to see some new blood, man. It's been Absolutely. boring. It's just been really boring for the past, you know, five, six, seven years. So, so yeah, that's maybe the, why I like to give, you know, help him out as much as I can. So, well, he's the only person so far that has successfully copied your game. You know, you've seen throughout the years people try and copy different types of games, right? Right. Um, you know, people have tried to copy Terry. They've tried to copy Todd. Um, but you always had that different style of foosball game. That nobody could could emulate. Nobody. Um, and Tommy has finally, you know, come along with it. Uh, Pipkin Jr. was probably the clo closest before him, uh, yeah. I would think. But uh, seeing Tommy truly, you know, use pretty much every, you know, every weapon that you have on the table uh, and mimic it very, very well, it's, it's pretty cool to see someone take it to that level and, and then make the right decisions uh, along the way as well. Well, yeah, and he and he's got and and I, that's the thing is, I look at Tommy and I said I see a lot of myself. He's not super talented, but he he's got drive. He's got heart. Uh, even something as awkward as the the push shot that we both shoot, you know, we don't have a whole lot of, of talent, you know. But you'll have you know here in the Tampa scene, we've got like Dylan Marshall. Dylan's unbelievable with the the power. That he can shoot his pull shot and just his style. So I compare him more to like a Billy who just hits the ball so crisply, so square, always like on the screws every time. And then you got someone like Tommy who's quick, kind of relentless, and always just digging and fighting and picking up loose balls. So, so again, I see a lot of myself in him. And uh, so naturally, I'm going to be drawn and I'm going to want to help him and. and you know, I'm, and it's flattering, man. It's flattering that somebody has, you know, tried to emulate a few of the things that, I, that I've done on the table. So It's super cool to see, truth be told. It's, it's yeah. nice, and you even said it's nice to have that new blood in the scene. Um, yeah. We've, we've gotten way far off this match, but uh, right now <laughs> it is 1-1, third game. You're down 3-2, uh, or 3-1, 3-1. Um, and Billy's got the ball on his five bar. Um, he's he's come to play. He's definitely here. Um, he's using it looks like the his his traditional stick series to some degree, throwing in that chip in there. Um, and he's you know, and Mara's it looks like has gone through about six different defenses so far, uh, trying to just get a piece, like you said. Um, is there is there any other insight like so far in this match that you know? Well, ooh, what just happened there? Do you just jar? Him? Probably. Billy and I are very, especially with Billy, we're, we're, we almost are oversensitive to each other. Like we don't want like to cheat each other to, you know, he's like probably the most fair player ever to play the game almost to, to a fault. So I don't, I don't want to, you know, and, and, and vice versa. Neither of us really want to win with any kind of bad blood or anything like that. So if there's even a question about it, we, we know the other is going to give the ball up. But, uh, but yeah, just like I said, we didn't know exactly what to do, you know, where to go with Billy because it's been so long that we played with him. And that's probably why Rob has cycled through so many different defenses, just trying to find something and just to try and get a feel. And But that's the thing is Torres has just been steady back there. He's, you know, he's just trying to clear the ball. He's not trying to do too much, and that's kind of what you want. Out of out of your goalie, and so many goalies tried to do too much, and they'll end up, 
you know, shooting. Look, he's just trying to clear the ball, just trying to chisel it down there. I was you know, lucky enough to pick that one up. But I actually think that's the it, first real mistake he's made in the match. Um, yeah, he's, which is which is crazy I, to think because he's by far the lowest ranked player on this table. Um, yeah, but 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 if you see, he's not scattering around. He's not chasing. He's he's just playing kind of a solid sneaky defense and like, like again mark knows how to play it's not like he you know he doesn't know how to play he's been around you know good save there and he's just he's just playing solid and steady and i and when 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 you're playing with a top player that's all you need to do right. as a goalie just would that be and, and so i didn't mean to cut you off but would that be probably the number one tip for for those new players it's like hey because most of them play the draws, right? And they're always hoping that they get you, they get Ryan, they get somebody. Um, would you suggest, hey, don't try and be the superhero, just you know, play clean, smart foosball? Well, as a goalie, you have to remember that you control the tempo of the match. You, you're kind of the quarterback back there, and it's up to you to make a decision when to go for it, when to, to chisel it, when to pass, when to shoot. So game management is really big but again if you're playing with a guy like me you don't i don't need you to score i'm going to score the ball i'm going to pass it and score i need you to to pick an area on the table wherever wherever your set may be and i want you to work that one area not not just to pass it to me but to give me an idea i want to read the defense with you and what i mean by that is Let's say, for instance, someone's setting up on the white line. You know, you can work that straight pass. You can work the slant down, and you could work, you know, a, a couple short sprays, whatever. I don't need you to go long. I don't need you to do pull kick passes or anything. If you work that one particular part of the, the, the goal and you just clear that three row, what I'm doing as a forward is I'm reading that defense with you, and I am – it helps me to – it helps me to – pick up the loose balls all those extra possessions that i that i get look at mark right now he's, oh yeah mark is calling his his wife in the middle of matches and he's just just getting under my skin man he's bothering so, me i actually i watch these i don't like to admit it on the air but i i, I watch these in advance and you, we can all tell it's getting under your skin because of this yeah. moment right here <laughs> we can all well, see it in your face there. Oh, you're a little frustrated now. And, and I'm sure uh, with 100% certainty that anytime you play Mark again, he's going to do that again. Well, I mean, you got to look at it from my perspective. You know, I, I, take, I take this very seriously. Like, this is my job. This is my livelihood. And there's, I mean, there's some ego involved, man. Like, I practice before a big tournament. I prepare. And... I've got this dude showing up, calling his wife in the middle of the match, making a joke out of it, drinking drinks, and, and he's beating me on top of it. So how do you think that makes me feel? I'm not liking it, you know? And, so, and he's in here making a joke of it. It's kind of a slap in the face to me. So, so yeah, and, and I'm, I'm a competitive dude. Like, you are. What, what, you know, how do you expect me to react? Do you want me to laugh with you? Like, you know, you're beating me and kind of making fun of the situation at the same time. So, yeah, he definitely got under my skin. So there's, people have asked me about you in the past and about your competitive drive. Uh, and I yeah. say to a lot of people, you're one of the most competitive people I've ever met. And I'm a competitive person, I feel like. Um, you know, there was a, a brief period of time where you and I were hanging out and we competed at everything we did. Like, it didn't matter if we were eating food. It didn't matter if we were walking back to the room. Okay? You would... You would be like, you want to race back to the room? Sure. <laughs> like, that's how competitive you are. And I, and I don't think people understand the drive and the passion that you have for foosball. Um, because they just see how good you are at it. They're like, oh, he can just do whatever you want. But there's a true passion and competitive nature within you that I don't think most people have. Um, and I think that that gives you a huge edge in, in everything that you do. Um, is that something that you found at all throughout your experience of playing? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. In order to to get good at this game, you have to be competitive at some 
you know, at some level. For me, um, I think it goes a little bit deeper than that. Uh, you know, as a younger kid, I was, you know, I, I was overweight and I, I didn't have a lot of confidence in anything that I really did. Um, kind of shy, unassuming. And within foosball, I found something that I could be good at and make me feel good about myself. So foosball especially, especially because I was at a young age. I was 12, you know, 11, 11 years old. And 11, 12, 13 years old, I'm competing with, with adults, and I'm beating them. And it was just a huge confidence booster for me. So naturally, like, once I started, you know, doing better, I found something that, that made me feel good. I, you know, it was just a, a natural confidence booster and, you know, made me want to compete more because the feeling of competing and succeeding and, and winning at something, you know, it, it makes you feel good. So, and, and again, this game, once you really get deeply wound up in it, you know, and, and then you start to have expectations. And when you have expectations of yourself and you can't meet them, you know, it really draws something out of you. It, it really can draw an ugly side out of people. You know, I, I've, I've been at my worst, you know, in, in matches sometimes. it's really, Sometimes it just really evokes a lot of emotion out of you. So, um, but yeah, again, naturally I'm a competitive person, but foosball is... You know, it's deeply rooted in my soul, man. I've been playing my whole life, and 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 again, like you have, you you, you learn to have ego when you become good at something, and if you feel threatened in any way, you know you're gonna react. You're gonna react, and you're gonna, you know, possibly come across a certain way. And but yeah, a, a lot of a lot of my success I attribute to not my physical ability but more my will to win my competitive side because i i i, I love it man i love to, to to compete and it's a good feeling yeah you have like a, an extra gear you know when when you get all fired up you can see it in you um and, and honestly all of this is a beautiful beautiful thing in my opinion um you know being a, a, a relatively chubby kid and and finding something <laughs> <laughs> finding something that brings you home, right? Defines you, gives you confidence, builds you up, yeah. and turn. I mean, it truly it turns you into who you are today. Uh, it's awesome. I mean, truly, yeah. truly, a great story if you look at it from that aspect. I mean, you can't write that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, thank you for being nice. I was a little bit more than <laughs> I was a little more than chubby, but. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, man, it, it's yeah, it's uh, it's been, again, it's been my whole life, and it's definitely shaped me who I was, and I never would have dreamed that it, it would come to this, and you know, take me to places that I've gone, and it's been a dream come true, man. It's pretty awesome. Not gonna lie. Yeah. So it is now. What is this? Three, three. Yeah, if you yeah. look at Billy's, Billy's got a little bit. He's a little bit more aggressive now. He's definitely more comfortable than he was in the first game. You can just kind of see that hop in his step, and it's a feeling out process. And, and it's match point. Well, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, he definitely has way more confidence, right? He's playing it with a whole different level than even in the beginning of it. So, right. And even you can tell Torres is now kind of focusing a little bit more as well. Um, they know that they have a chance to, to be world champions. There's really no question involved there. So so they have kind of gotten to that realization and, and turned the pressure around to you. Well, again, now now Billy's getting on my five a little bit. I'm starting to rush. Torres is under my skin. You know, <laughs> he's gotten a couple blocks. Yeah. Well, he's there. It is game game over. And they end up winning. Yeah. Which. I mean, that, that's how it goes, man. And look, and he's got, what is Mark saying? He's mouthing off to me again.
Hey guys, uh, so during the taping, unfortunately, we lost some of the video footage of what's transpiring between me and Tony. However, I was able to save the audio. So I've just thrown in some video clips and some things that I might find entertaining for you guys uh, so that you have something to watch while we do talk. I do apologize, but bear with us. This guy. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, man. You and I had a, a light, brief conversation before this. You said you, you did, however, get to play them again. And the outcome, the outcome wasn't the same. Yeah, I believe we got to play them again in the loser's bracket. And it's weird. It's a weird thing with Billy. Because he didn't, I don't, if I remember correctly, he didn't come kind of with the same intensity. And it's so strange because Billy's such a nice guy. Like, he almost... He'll win and then, like, feel bad for winning, kind of. Like, I mean, how many times have you seen Billy win a match and as he's winning or scoring a shot, he'll, like, shake his head in, like, disappointment or, you know, or he'll apologize, you know. He doesn't have that. And that's one thing that Billy lacked. As amazing as, as he is as a foosball player, he never really had that full fire and that full drive. And... I mean, thank God he didn't have it because I don't, <laughs> think you would, I don't think you would ever lose if you had, you know, that kind of fight. But Yeah, um, I mean, you're, you're – right. right. And, and you kind of said it. He's got a ton of talent, but you have that competitive drive that I, I, I do believe is the reason for your success. Um, I mean, not to negate the fact that you obviously have talent, right, clearly, because you would never get to the level that you're at without it. But your drive, your ability to practice, your thought process on the table – it is truly what makes you the number one player in the world, man. Well, I'll tell you, the lack of my talent has attributed to my success because what happens is it, it limits me, and it limits me making stupid mistakes on the table. If you think about it, like if I could do a double tic-tac off the wall, slingshot, you know, whatever – I'd probably try it more often. I just can't do the shit. So. <laughs> I'd probably do it and something, you know. Full you know, speed nothing, spike. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nothing positive really comes of, you know, comes of it. That, you know, it, the crowd goes, ooh. But it's also the same as if I do a two to the five pass, a five to three and shoot a rollover, you know. And, and I'm learning something throughout that process where, you know, it's just not as pretty. And it's boring. It's not about. <laughs> but my. Go ahead. Finish up. No, just no, no, just the the lack of it, the lack of talent. And I do attribute to some of the success because it's um, resulted in discipline for me. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's a joke I make anytime I score a slop shot in, in some kind of pickup game. It's not about how. It's about how many. So <laughs> it's dumb, but it's true. It's not about how, it's about how many. Now, yeah. but it, it, everybody, you always hear, well, you have to shoot a rollover, you have to shoot a pull shot to win tournaments. Eh, probably not exactly accurate because you kind of have proven that to some degree. I, I've seen you shoot a push shot. It's pretty incredible. You've won events shooting a push shot. Um, so, so it's very possible. Um, well, the pull kick as well. And, and again, yeah. when, I, when I go through, when I go and do my lessons, First thing I say is it doesn't really matter what you do. There's no right or wrong way to play the game. It's about having your series and having your options and making sure that each one of those options complement each other. And, and it doesn't really matter, you know, what the options are, but as long as you can work them together in a series. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of On the Table. Make sure you check out Foos Buying Series on Facebook and get a class going. It's going to be the best thing for your game, bar none. It's not even questionable. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And until next time, everyone, happy foosin'.